Chang Su Jung is an artist and video editor who lives and works in New York. Um, she is originally from Seoul, South Korea, and uh, received her BFA at um, the EY Women's University in Seoul and um, her master's degree in fine arts from Hunter College in New York. And this is just her education. It at, at, um, includes at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Um, she's, she's had uh, probably three solo exhibi exhibitions in the last few years and participated in many selected group exhibitions, including um, one at the Walter Elwood Museum in Amsterdam, as well as um, the Gallery Christine Mayer in Munich, Germany. Um, and we had the pleasure of having uh, Su Jung as an artist in residence at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center in uh, this past August, in, um, where she produced some new work, which I believe was in a, a recent um, exhibition, and mostly um, really inspired the interns as well as the other participants that were taking workshops at the time. Um, incredibly productive. I think it was um, really a great model for the people around you to see how ambitious you were and focused and, you know, still while being sociable and, you know, really participating in the community that is the arts, uh, that is the arts community in West Rutland. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I entered, that I turned it over to you, uh, Sujan, and share with us some of your your work okay cool um i'm gonna share my screen um so everyone can see sure can do you see the whole yes image okay okay um let me um so Thanks. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for inviting me, and um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Chang Su Jung, actually Su Jung Chang. I live work in New York City as an artist. You can call me Su Jung because that's my first name, but I go by Chang Su Jung professionally since that's how my name is written and called in Korean. So the Korean name order is last name comes first and first name is after. Um, these are my sketchbook covers from 2014, uh, which is the year that I moved to New York from Seoul. Uh, maybe around 2017, I noticed that the way that I write my name on my sketchbook covers had been kept changing. Um, I felt like these are the reflection of how I want to kind of present myself in the United States. So I thought it's fun to look at them, <laughs> how I write my name. Um, and for today's uh, presentation, I there will be some parts that I'm going to just read what I prepared because, uh, I don't know, English is my not my first language, so I, you know, I just want to feel comfortable and just, you know, read. Um, and so, like I said, um, I moved to the United States in 2014, go to grad school, and I went to Hunter College in New York City. I was primarily making videos when I was in school, but then my videos were like stage performances. Uh, so I often built stage and made props. So there are some like a, lots of sculptural elements. Um, I was planning to watch one play, one video that I made in 2019, 2018. Uh, it's short, it's less than th three minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna play that. Uh,
Can you look at everything? Is everything look fine? Yeah. No, it's good. Yep. Here. Yogi. Yogi up is a mukakap sinida. Yogi. Yogi no muchungange sinida. 이 자리는 유난히 좁은 것 같습니다. 저는 왼손잡이라 원형 테이블에 앉을 때에는 고려할 것이 많습니다. 이 자리는 눈에 너무 잘 띄는 것 같습니다. 이 꽃보단 다른 꽃이 더 좋습니다. 이쪽에 앉으면 대화가 재미없을 때 자연에 매료된 척 밖을 보면서 딴청을 피울 수도 있을 것 같습니다. 근데 걔는 어디 앉을지 궁금합니다. 또 걔가 이쪽에 앉으면 어떡하지 생각했습니다. 걔는 항상 오른쪽 조금 뒤에 앉았습니다. 이 자리는 좀 멀긴 하지만 대화가 재미없을 때 뒤에 있는 프레스코 얘기나 하면서 제가 분위기를 바꿀 수 있지 않을까 생각했습니다. 여긴 너무 중앙인 것 같습니다. 다시 생각해도 이쪽은 너무 중앙인 것 같습니다. 저는 동등한 발언권이 어떨 땐 너무 싫습니다. 나는 갑자기 이런 생각을 하면 뭐하나 그냥 운명에 맡겨버리면 되지. 되는 대로 앉아 생각했습니다. 내가 같이 앉고 싶어하는 사람의 수가 내가 피하고 싶은 사람의 수보다 결코 많지 않다는 것을 알았습니다. 어쩌면 이런 생각하는 것 자체가 시간 낭비일 수 있습니다. 그냥 나는 오늘 그 사람 뒤로 들어와서 그냥 그 사람 옆에 앉으면 됩니다. back to the slide. Um, is everything working well? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I made this video, Where Should I Sit Tonight? When I was at Skahigan Residency. It's a residency in Maine. Uh, I was just walking around with a camera and then walk into the barn where that dinner table setup was. Um, I think that there, that night was the night that we had trustee and board member dinner with the residents. So they had this like a 200 people uh, dinner situation. And I had no script or any plan. I just like walk around the campus with the camera. And then when I walked into the barn without expecting to, expected to see this situation, uh, but I just like started to shoot. Uh, and then the script came after after watching uh, like this footage uh, several times. Um, so from now, I'm going to show my, my recent sculptures, uh, which are mostly made out of stones, uh, marble and alabaster. Like I said, I was making videos and also making money from editing other artists' videos, um, but it was pretty hard because when you are video artists and then also make video for other people, you ended up just working in front of your computer all the time. Uh, like literally I was just like opening someone else's video file to edit and then save it, close it, open mine uh, to edit. So there was really like no physical and mental separation uh, between job, like a gig and then 
my artwork. Um, I was also going through like visa issues. Um, and then also on top of that, I moved eight times in the, in the, I moved 12 times in the past eight years in New York City. So carving stone was some started some sort as a, some sort of like a remedy kind of to be away from the screen. But also there was a, I remember this specific night that kind of made me start carving stone, which was um, my friend invited me over to her, uh, to her apartment for dinner. And it was very nice night. Like we had like wine, food, but then I saw, I saw that she owns this really heavy di dining table and uh, it looked really heavy. And then I actually never really seen horses in my, like, like clothes in my life, but, and I don't really know about horses, but when I saw the table, I felt like, wow, like the, it looks very heavy and it, it looks so sturdy, like, like a horse legs. Um, but then it was also very shocking encounter with the table because it made me realize that all my stuff was made out of plastic, like Ikea stuff or like Home Depot, Walmart, uh, like plastic, light or collapsible or multifunctional uh, stuff, uh, which was never like the, the heavy dining table. And then that was also the first time that I felt homesick uh, because I think that it showed that like I don't have stability in my life here. So the experience of having to move again and again led me to reflect on size, scale, and weight and mobility of my objects. So I decided to carve the versions of my bedroom furniture and other personal belongings out of alabaster. So each item weight is held constant, meaning despite their reduced size, the stone version of my items are exactly as heavy as their full scale counterparts. Um, I wanted my work to retain some sense of stability, yet they're still mobile due to their size because, you know, the size matters in moving, but I also didn't want to give up on all the physical attributes of my objects, so I can't kept the weight same. So basically, stone is much like denser than other objects that we have, or like a plastic or wood or anything. That even if I keep the weight the same, they all shrink in size. Um, so I started carving stone not necessarily from material like attraction, but more like from the concept. And then I didn't know I was gonna love carving stone so much that I'm gonna keep doing this after this project. So I'll show some detail images. Uh, these are all from the show that I had in New York in Chelsea at this gallery called Tessa Flato. Um, this is my full, full size mattress. Uh, with the pillow and um, comforter, there's the books. And I, as you may, might notice that I also put weight in my, um, the work dimension part for this project because weight was pretty important. Uh, so this is the Ikea step stool. Uh, this is another view of the show. So because the weight uh, is like kind of a, size this deciding factor that there's no overarching scale like like if you see the step stool that's way too big thinking how small the mattress is uh also you can stop me and ask question um this is uh you know like i think that everyone wants to own this uh, which is the plastic drawer from like Walmart or whatever, wherever. Um, this is the only item that I carved twice. So it's based, it's, so the model is 
a single uh, plastic drawer. This, uh, and then the bigger one, I the weight of this bigger one is the weight when I have all my stuff in. And then the smaller one is I weigh the plastic drawer when it's empty. So that's why it turned out into like two different sizes, even if the model is the exact same um, drawer. Um, this is the L brackets. It's Ikea L brackets. It's a 0.1 pound. It's very small. Uh, this is the, my favorite gooseneck lamp. Um, they're all alabaster. Okay. I think that there was, oh, this one. So this was also from that project, which is, you know, when you move so many times, and then from like sublet to sublet, there's always like one or two days where when you have two apartment keys. Uh, so I, this is like my old apartment key. One is like the app, like the apartment, like the second apartment. And this is the first when I was moving a lot. Um, this is also uh, way, this also weighs like exactly same as my metal um, keys and then but then the metal is much denser than stone, I guess. So like, this is the only object that actually got bigger than the original. So th this kind of looks like a kid's toy key or something. So they're slightly bigger. Uh, so after finishing this project, no table with a horse die, which we just saw, I became interested in things I do not carry when I move specifically the floor and the ceiling. I start to see a massage table with, you know, the massage table with the face hole as a kind of perfect union of the floor and ceiling because the massage bed horizontally cuts the vertical direction of the space. And with my face down, I'm looking downwards as if I'm the ceiling. And at the same time, I am also on this platform, which is the bed, which is the vertical extension of the floor. Um, so this is massage bed that I show that um, this is not a art fair in upstate New York. Um, this is a close up, um, also made out of alabaster. Uh, so if you see, so there there were the small earrings dropped under the bed. Uh, and then I actually have a kind of funny story uh, from like with this earring, which is um, so because I don't own massage bed, I needed to see the massage bed in person uh, to carve. And, you know, like online images and stuff, you don't really see how they're constructed, like how the leg is attached to the top. So I actually went to the massage place in Chinatown, which was near my studio then. And then, you know, when, because I had to go under the bed to take pictures of the, how the leg was constructed or how the leg was attached to the top. But then I, I thought maybe if they spot me, I'm gonna crawl under the bed, it would be so weird. So I needed to come up with some sort of reason why I'm under the bed in case they ask me, what are you doing? Uh, so I intentionally dropped my earring under the bed so that I have a perfect reason to crawl under the bed. So, and actually when I was uh, taking pictures under the massage, under the massage table, uh, massage bed, they, you know, at, behind the curtain, they was, they, are you okay? Because I think that I was taking so much time more than usually what people change. Uh, and then I just tell them, oh, I dropped, I just dropped my earring. I'm I'm looking. So they're like, oh, okay, take your time. So of course I took my time to take <laughs> pictures. Um, and so, and then after making the work, um, I thought, um, you know, this work is about like floor and ceiling and kind of like, you know, union of ceiling and the floor. I thought it would be nice to have some sort of a uh, thing that draws attention to the bottom of the object too. So like I made a miniature earring to drop 
to, to put under the bed so that audience can also kind of approach to the bottom side of the work as well. Um, so that was very small earring. Um, this is the drawing that I kind of wanted to show because the drawing, I feel like this is a drawing for this massage bed object and this massage bed piece. Um, but I wanted to say that the drawing is not always a sketch of what I'm going to make. It's sometimes, um, it is just different form that shares the same idea with the sculpture. So, um, so this is, yeah, this is that. And now I want to show some images and works from one of my recent shows that was at International Waters in Brooklyn. So most, so like most of stone objects in the show, I made it at Carving Studio in uh, last August. It was two person show with Chris Dominic, which is, who is the artist that I really admire for many years. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really look clear in this picture, but the gallery has eight degree inclination, like like an indoor hill. And Chris made this uh, display structure, uh, which is a kind of winding, uh, this long shape. Uh, and I made all the objects that goes on top of this, this sculpture slash structure. Uh, there were some fabric objects that I saw and some marble sculptures that I made during the residency and some alabaster objects that I made uh, before going to uh, carving studio. Um, so we we're going to see some images from the show. This image, you can kind of see that the space has uh, inclination. Um, so it was very mazy, fun exhibition. Um, this is my first marble sculpture I made, the marble that I carved. Uh, this is the dog poop bags, you know, the green bag uh, that I carve in uh, alabaster. Uh, I mean, like, like you can see um, there are arms, but also there are sleeves in, in all these pictures. So on my part of the show, sleeve was the main subject for the show. I became interested in sleeves as a conceptual object in 2017. Um, while I, I remember very clearly because it was 2017 June because I was reading a catalog of works by the artist Stuart Sherman, it's, which is called Nothing on My Sleeve. So this is Stuart Sherman. I just want to put one slide uh, of him. Um, because I'm not native English speaker, I didn't know what nothing of my sleeve means. So I looked it up and le I learned that it's often used by magicians to show that there's no hidden trick to their magic. The phrase felt so accurate in describing his work and it was stuck in my head ever since. His most known performance series, Spectacle, employs a typical magician setup using desks with small objects on top. However, in his performance, nothing is hidden. We see the work that the artist is doing in front of you. He's constantly moving objects on top of, on the tabletop with wide open suitcase from which he pulled out the objects. Uh, we witness his process and there's no trick and maybe there's no magic. So this is like the his spectacle performance documentation and then i i don't I, I forgot actually how many spectacle he created but this is like i think the right one is 11 spectacle and he like you can you see the suitcase that he he just brings objects out of it and then just moves the object as if he's about to do some sort of magic but actually there's like there's nothing happening actually um so, so I just want to bring this up because the sleeve, my first kind of interest at the sleeve as a conceptual object came from reading this catalog. Um, 
oh, these are all, it's funny that I was just talking about sleeves so much and then we're looking at not sleeves, but these are all the uh, stone sculptures that I made um, there were that which were in the show. This is my first marble carving that I did at uh, Carving Studio. Uh, I actually have a very good story, uh, which made, which is also sleeve related story. And then that's why the title of this work came from. So this conversation was with my friend who was a senior student in my college when I was a freshman. We were having lunch with our professor. The professor paid the bill and then the, and my friend said, thank you so much. You don't have to buy me lunch all the time. And looked at me, she looked at me, my friend looked at me and then said, I think the half of my arm was created by the meals that the professor bought me. It was a comment that flattered the professor. As a student, as the student made the comment, she rolled her sleeve up and showed her bare arm as if the sleeve was covering the point of her story, her intention, and her truthfulness. So I thought it's it's just like really funny that she needed to show me bare arm in front of the professor while she was make she was making that flattery comment. And um it was such a bizarre encounter with her. So like I also had that in my head for a while. Uh, and it came back as I was working on the show that had to do with the sleeve. Um, these are all, yeah, so like all this, this stone carvings are what I made uh, in August. Um, and then also the sundial watch. Um, okay. Go back to sleep. I'm going to talk about sleeve a little more. Uh, so the sleeve is directly correlated to deception of deception and truth in Korean. Okay, well, I'm going to read it again. The sleeve is directly correlated to deception and truth in the Korean equivalent of pickpocketing. Translated to pick sleeving, the Korean idiom refers to the sleeve being a place where you keep invaluable things in Korean traditional clothing. So pickpocketer in old Korea would, would not seek their targets onto your pockets, rather they would steal from your sleeve, the carrier of your items. I'm interested in sleeve as a carrier. It's a container for a human arm, tricks, objects, and what we believe as a truth. I make sleeves without a torso, so therefore they lose their commodity value as the articles of fashion. Um, in doing so, my sleeves become independent objects as a casing or carrier, considering also that to wear one's heart on one's sleeves means to openly show one's feeling or emotions uh, and thus allow oneself to be vulnerable. I cannot help myself from thinking about the entangled relationship between the sleeve and being truthful. I was thinking, is it because the shape of the sleeve mimics a part of our bodies and suggests some sort of the intimacy between flesh and fabric so perfect, so perfectly in union? Or is it a trick to better hide truth in an exposed area? You know, like sometimes I think that the best way to conceal something is when it's laid bare out in the open for people to ignore. Um, so, so these are sleeve of uh, like a fabric. I actually had a sleeve make like a t-shirt, like a shirt pattern. And then I like, only cut the part of the sleeve and then actually sew them uh, with my sewing machine. Um, so these are all, so these are all the sleeves that were in the show with the arms. And then I also wanted to really make arms with marble because it's, it's really funny to me. I don't know, it's obvious, but it's really funny to me when I fall sometimes, my shirt rips and then my arm's fine. And then sometimes when I fall, my arm 
gets hurt, but then the my clothes is totally fine. So I, I just like don't know which one protects what. And then when I think when I was planning on the show, I was like thinking about the stone that the stone is such a hard material, but then it's also super fragile. So like imagine like if I put my arms in like let's say if I put this marble arms in my uh sleeves sculpture and then drop it and then it's probably the arm the stone will be the one that's gonna break so I don't like the arm shape also kind of like talks about you know it's what's going inside and then kind of relationship with the uh body and then the container so that's why I also wanted to put the include the arms in the show uh and then this is kind of the final piece that I want to talk about. Uh, I'll show this part first. Um, oh. Which translates to We Are Happy, is the title of Korean artist Park Iso's last piece. The work exists in two different forms. It's a drawing, like an instruction, and a building, actual building sign. My drawing is based on his drawing with the language on the sign translated in English from the original Korean. So, so on the left, that's his drawing. Um, and then I basically copied it and then, but I translated the, the sign. Uh, this artist, he lived in New York City for about 13 years in his late twenties to thirties and has become one of the most important artists to me. His experience of migration to a foreign country in adulthood and the ethical and artistic debate between assimilation and strategic distancing in the United States have felt more palpable now than when I was in Korea as a college student. Translation is a big part of his work. For example, he translated Billy Joel's Honesty in Korean, into Korean, and sang his Korean version in his sh in his one of his shows. I recently found out that Billy Joel's "Honesty," the origin of lyrics, contain an English expression "to wear one's heart out one uh, to wear one's heart out on on one's sleeve." Since this is an idiomatic expression, the Korean lyrics doesn't contain the same equivalent to the word sleeve. So when I found out the word sleeve was not lost in translation of Billy Joel's song, I felt it was serendipitous and wanted to create a work from it as an homage to the artist. I chose his last piece, which is We're Happy. The sentence We're Happy feels like it's a hopeful statement and pro probably that is what we want because it's not because it's what we don't have. I also wanted to create a sleeve with this drawing on, the like drawing printed on, because I think a sleeve is a type of sign uh, as well, that which has the inside and outside, which can reflect the contradiction and honestness, honestiness. Um, so this is the how it how it's made. So I made this. Uh, drawing on paper and then like kind of very high resolution scan it and then print it on the fabric so I can sew this sleeve uh, which is all from this drawing. Um, this is the very last slide of the presentation. Um, it's called it's a gallery called Minor Injury. Uh, it was it was in Greenpoint in New York in from like 88 or 80. Some people say 86, some people say 88 till like early 90s. Uh, it was the actually the, it's, it was the this artist who made We Are Happy building sign. He ran this gallery and it was the, the first, one of the first galleries in New York City, which only shows the artists who are, in, who are people of color. Uh, so, you know, not many people know about this history and then, I don't know, I feel very, these are very important for me. Uh, so I just wanted to end here.
So this is the slide. This is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so I have a question unless somebody would like to start um, besides me, you can just, okay. Um, that the most recent one, I'm sorry, I don't know who the collaboration was with. Um, Chris. Yes. Um, so how do you go about bringing your shared vision for that space. I mean, it's it, it's a phenomenal setting or, or, and I, I really like what you've done with the objects and the, um, I, I think of them as, as ramps almost or conveyor belts. <laughs> and uh -huh. I just, I wonder how you are able to, um, does it take a, what's the process like to collaborate with, with this artist? Uh, it was really organic. Actually, it was, it was, um, it was very fun. At first, I was so happy that he is going to share with me because I love his work, uh, for so many years. Um, and, you know, I, we both had this, like, a plan before having the first meeting, just me and him without the gallerist. Uh, I had this like whole plan that I'm going to carve this and this in, in Vermont when I go to, you know, the residency. Uh, I had all these plans, but after meeting with Chris, I think that we both kind of dropped our original plan and then just come up with a new plan after having some conversations. And uh, I don't know, I think that uh, actually the, the reason that's sleeve was kind of stayed as a main thing theme of my part of the show was because I initially asked him oh I want to make really long sleeve that is like 11 feet long uh and he was like oh I want to then I want to make some sort of like vitrine or some sort of like a display uh for your work because I think that Chris had this like history of collaborative collaborating with other artists and then make some display apparatus for them as his part of the collaboration. And then and then like he came to the space and he was like, you know what? I actually want to make like kind of like a crazy like a drawing line type of structures, you know, kind of like across the space. And then he was like, you can always put your work on it. And I was like, oh really? Okay. <laughs> so that's, it was kind of like, like it was very organic uh, process uh, with him. And um, yeah, it, yeah. So that was a kind of how, how everything was. And you didn't make the 11 foot sleeve. <laughs> in the I, end. I, I, I actually did. Cause this, this one, um, this, this one is almost 11 feet. Wow. This is, uh, there, it, it is just like a, so if you pull one end of the sleeve and then the other end, of, it's like one, it, it's like a one really long sleeve, three sleeves connected as a one. And then I, I, it was kind of like a, uh, maze and it was kind of folded inside mm -hmm. from here to here, here to here and here to here. So if you actually pull it and then open it, it's actually like almost 11 feet. Um, so I did make it, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't one really long. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that, yeah, it was, it was very, yeah, it was very fun working with him. Uh, hi, I had a, I had a question. Go ahead, Eva. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks for showing your work. I was um, curious about your journey, um, like from when you were carving alabaster to when you switched to marble, and how did you like feel like that and feel the new material? And 
I know you were talking about like the weight of objects earlier and did that, how did that um, affect your approach to like the weight and resistance of the material in relation to the objects you were carving? So the, the first part of the question was like the difference between marble and alabaster. Yeah, or like, you, or you said you um, kind of, this was your, this past summer was your first experience with, with marble, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so how did you like that transition and yeah. how did, what were your first impressions of the new material? I, yeah, I think that, I mean, what I learned by carving marble at carving, uh, carving studio uh, was, was, um, Actually, alabaster carving and marble carving are very different. It's like, almost like totally different things. <laughs> that the tools are different, um, and then I don't. It's 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 actually very different. I mean, I think that I I picked up pretty quickly uh, when Tom showed me how to like use tools and like kind of the first spending first week learning uh, about the material and tools. Uh, because I had a background of carving alabaster, but it, it was very different because tools are different, like kind of, um, you know, like like how much, like a pressure that I've had to put to carve were different. Um, I think that like, I feel like now I have experience of carving both of them. I think that now, like, I just feel like, Oh, I will. I now I carve marble. I'm not gonna carve. I, I think that it's that I just now have a more options because they're very different for me. Um, I like. I don't know. Like alabaster is fun. I I like kind of the translucency of alabaster, and then but also like marble is actually more fun carving the actual process of carving I think marble is more fun uh, because it's so hard <laughs> it's kind of like I think I like the challenge of that um, but I feel like they are just like two different things that I I'm that now I can choose you know because before I never carved marble so you know I always kind of like look at marble when I go get alabaster I just look at marble and wow they look so beautiful you know and then thinking that that's not my option but I now I feel like you know I can also do that um well, what was the second part of your question Eva do you have um the second part of the question uh, I was a uh, mess I don't know technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I noticed like you were like when you were carving marble, like the approach was towards um, these arms and like how did you think about like the firmness of the material in relation to like this, um, you know, the, the arm that you were carving that um, I guess did that, did that make you think about like the arm differently that it's this soft thing and, and I noticed you were using several different types of marble and did that imbue the, the object itself with a, a different um uh feeling in in like in particular like did the arms themselves um each one did it feel a little bit different or was it oh uh, it, within within the show, like did it have a special meaning within the show based on oh, like, in, in the show, oh me using three different type of yeah or I, I guess this doesn't have to be intentional but did oh. like, did 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 the I don't know you were saying like oh it's so much harder so did the resistance of the material kind of make you mm -hmm. feel different things about the several different arms that you were carving did they mean something different. Yeah, I mean, something yeah. yeah. I think Sorry. that I think that choosing I think that when I was first choosing marble to carve at uh carving studio was um I I think that I 
first, I, I had this only one criteria where I want to avoid like a white marble. Like I, I didn't, I didn't want to use like, like beautiful white marble. I mm -hmm. wanted to use some like, you know, the marble that has like kind of like colors on it, which is, this is like the first marble that I picked to carve. It has like kind of greenish, it's, it's actually more yellow in person. Uh, and I think this wasn't, this was like so painful to carve. Like, I think that I remember everyone said, don't do this. Um, this is technically travertine as far as I know, I think. And then this, it was actually like a kind of building material uh, that, that, you know, people make like window frames or a pillar, but I also thought arm is also pillar. So why not? Uh, so I just tried it, but it was much harder than other uh, other marble, uh, and then shatters differently. Uh, yeah, but then I think that like my only criteria was like no white marble uh, for the arms. Uh, I don't know, maybe I don't know how I didn't. I don't have like a like specific or like a strong uh, reason like artistic reason behind it necessarily. But uh, I think that because I was for a while, I was like pretty obsessed with this uh, uh, show at Met, Met, uh, the Met in New York. I think that that's up right now, which is the, it, it's like a show with the, you know, Greek sculptures used to be colored. You know, it's like very colorful. It's not like a white uh, marble, but, you know, so there's a show that kind of like the marble copy of what they have in the museum with the paint on it. Uh, so I don't know. I think that like I for arms, I want to use, I, I think for a second, I was thinking about painting it. But then I was like, you know, I, I want to use the marble that has color for the arms, um, maybe because of, I was kind of thinking about the, in, you know, in the past, the, the marble were colored. I don't know, I, I, that was like the only criteria that I was trying to, you know, set, uh, no white marble. Um, and then some mar marble that looks like kind of vain, um, like skin and flesh and this looked like that. Um, so that was that, yeah. So I, I have two questions. <laughs> okay. okay. My first question is what inspired the, the doggy bags of poop um, oh. I, you have to be the very first sculptor that I've ever seen to do that. Um, very unique. And I, I'm also curious as to what's next because it's so exciting to see a uh, stone carver conceptual artist. Mm. Uh, I, okay, so I think that um, I, I carved poop bag because in New York City, it's so dirty and then I see poop bags everywhere you know like on my way to the studio i see like 30 poop bags just like thrown on the street but also i think that this i made this poop bag before i went to carving studio um and then you know i started carving stone in 2019 so i made this last year so you know it was like like three years of experience of carving stone, not so long, but I, I, I think that like I my not struggle, but like I I think that what I noticed that when you carve stone, um, you kind of have this like a solid model that, or at least I did like I I wasn't carving directly like or like I my process is always like kind of having a model or like what I want to carve. And then kind of in a way copying it, like, you know, like the, the previous alabaster stone piece 
of course I needed to scale down. Uh, but, you know, I was still like copying, uh, like with the ruler, you know, like the, the ruler and, and then, and then I, I think that, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was thinking, oh, what if, what if I carve something that's constantly moving or something that is hard to keep perfectly, you know, solid. And then I, I, I don't know, maybe because I was looking at the poop bag all the time on the street on my way to studio, I, I saw the poop bag with the wind moving like really, you know, really like, it looks really sad, but like the poop, like the plastic bag kind of by wind, like moving. Uh, and then, <laughs> oh, what if, what if I carve poop bag? Because like, it's, it's a plastic bag. So, you know, it's hard to keep it solid. Because like, you know, it, I mean, it's pretty meticulous. Uh, how they how it took really long time for me to carve each of them like I think each took me like two three weeks um but then over two three weeks the the plastic you know deflates and you know keep moving it's almost impossible to keep it solid and then I really enjoy the process of like oh there's like one moment my my stone um sculpture looks exactly like this poop bag but because of next day the poop bag moved a little bit then my work is not looking similar anymore you know <laughs> kind of like this uh, challenge but also fun with the working with moving things uh and then so I didn't really made this work for the show but uh when I had a meeting with the gallerists, they were like, oh, but poop bag is also container. Cause like the show with my part about the sleeve and then uh, Chris making this con basically container for my work, um, the, they wanted, oh, maybe we should put the poop bag. So it's like also container. And then I also think that what's funny about poop bag is that we just think when, it, when we see this green bag, you just think about poop immediately but then actually you can use it for food you know it does it doesn't have to be the poop is not pasted inside but I feel it's a dirty thing but it actually you can use it for whatever um so that's that's why it's included in the show and then the next project actually has to do with that that I want to I'm going to start carving flowers like like a live flower like a like a flower not not the fake flower but the actual flower and then see how I'm am dealing with flower wilting over time and then capturing that in stone carving because I assume that it will take me some time to carve flowers um and then of course the flower flower will wilt so that's kind of actually I, your question, like actually from the poop bag experience. Do, do, yeah. you, do you find that um, your video work informs at all your carving and you plan to get back to any video work? Oh, uh, I think, I think so. I mean, I, I, don't, I actually, you know, after starting, so I still make money editing other people's videos, but I don't know. I love carving so much that I don't want to go back, but maybe I will. I don't know if when I when I have a good idea, <laughs> maybe I'll go back. But I also think that uh, video editing and carving are in a way similar. Where you know, video. I think the mentality is similar. Where like when I edit video, I you know I start with hours of footage and then make you know like two minute video or three minute video. I, I think the carving also, you start with the big, huge, you know, stone, and then it's always kind of like cut into the shape that you need. Like, and, and when you mentioned the motion of the poop bag, it made uh, me think that motion was something you loved in your video work and you're bringing it oh, into yeah. your carving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I didn't think that way, but uh, yeah, maybe. I didn't think about that way, but. That makes sense. 
that totally makes sense. I yeah, but I don't know. I I think that like the video editing, the, like you know, kind of making a perfect cut or like you know, is similar to like you know that you have to make a, like a kind of perfect cut uh, when you carve because there there's no way to go back in carving. So I see that real you know similarity. I think something that I really identified with that you shared early on, and this relates to the poop bag as well, um, was looking around your apartment and seeing all the things made of plastic and how that reflected this instability of your life since moving to the United States. And, um, you know, you've totally changed the nature of the poop bag when you've changed the material of it. And I, I really felt that way the most strongly when you shared those plastic containers because uh -huh. I did, I had those in college and I hated <laughs> using them because they were so flimsy and, yeah. you know, they were terrible to like, you couldn't drag them across the floor without breaking them, you know, and they just stuck. And, um, you know, when you remade them with this transparent alabaster, my perception of how they feel and how they look totally changes, you know, mm -hmm. because of the material and the softness of the edges. And um, yeah, I, I think it's just amazing the way that, um, changing the material can can rearrange our perception of of things. You know, the, the poop bag doesn't look like something I want to throw away anymore. It looks like <laughs> something I want to like explore and pick up and move around in my hand, which I would never do if I was seeing a poop bag on the ground in New York City. Um, and then I think another thing you you mentioned about just working in stone is kind of like how it helped you get away from your life in New York City and kind of the the slow nature of carving. And mm -hmm. almost like you're exploring the thera therapeutic nature of the material. Um, totally. Yeah. And so I, my question stemming from all of this is how have your experiences using stone changed your perception of what art can be, you know, moving from video to stonework? Mm. I, I, you know, I think that, I think that, um, I don't know if I have a, like, good answer for that, but I think that or maybe because you brought up like the stone carving is such a like slow process. And then I, and then it's like, you know, I think that like, I almost don't think about other things when I carve. Like I don't even listen to music when I carve. Whereas when I video edit or photo, I also do photo retouching a lot. And then like, I always play TV show or some sort of music. Uh, but then stone carving, you know, I don't even want to listen to music. So I think that like the meditative, meditative um, uh, ness of the process. And also like, I think that, you know, most things, you know, like sculpting or video editing or like other like art ma making, like uh, art making material and process, like, you know, for example, like casting, you make kind of perfect mold and then you just like pour things and, you know, and then you can just make a copy and double or triple, um, which is like, feels like, you know, shortcut. And then video editing, there's a shortcut. You can always go back or redo, undo. Whereas carving, you know, like each surface has to be treated with my hand. Otherwise I won't get this surface. And then I think that just the, it's just like almost like the most honest way of uh, spending time. That's how I feel about carving stone. Like it's like the most way of experiencing time and also spending time. That's, I think that that's why it, it, it feels so meditative. And then also um, like, I don't, I don't want to do other things than carving. But I, but also I think that maybe because of that aspect, like when you see carved object, like you can feel the time, like you can, you know, you, as an audience, you know, so. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, like you're saying, if you're pouring a cast, it's almost like the pouring kind of does some of the work for you. Totally, whereas, yeah, yeah. Whereas, yeah, you're touching every surface when you're carving and stone. Mm -hmm. yeah, I really appreciate that. So I have a quick question about the measuring. 
for the mm -hmm. most recent work? Um, is it just the a jumping off point where you were really using the um, a pro the weight of the plastic, changing the scale, and coming up with a weight for the marble interpretation? Um, is is that at peace now, <laughs> <laughs> or or do you see that sort of? Um, and I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this, but just mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating to me that there's a correlation between the furniture that you have and the um, interpretation into this, which you're you're not making a, a specific scale representation, but you're bearing the weight as part of the intention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I I I think that. Um... Of course, like the size is, I don't know, when I was making this, I was thinking, yeah, like the size is important, but <laughs> weight is also important for moving. Uh, like for easy move, I want like the light stuff. And uh, I don't know, I think that like for me, when I think of move, moving, I I concern about weight because I'm not like a very strong person. So I think that like if I don't, if I can't lift it, I can't have it. Uh, whereas like the size, big size, of course it's hard to carry, but also there's a way to like, you know, you can fold it or, you know, I think that size is in a way like, like, um, like, a, like I can overcome like size, big size, I can like fold it into smaller size, you know, whereas the weight, they don't go anywhere. So if it's a heavy, I can't lift or, you know, so I think that that's why I want to keep the weight the same for this project. Cause that's, um, that's something that I can't change. Um, so when I, even when I translate, uh, my plastic object or like cheap, uh, uh, mattress into stone, that's why the, oh, the weight shouldn't change because uh, size is changeable even if I'm not uh, translating from one material to stone so um, that's why I came up with the idea of maybe I should keep the weight the same but I'll make the size smaller so it's easier to move but then I, I realized after finishing this project I realized that honestly what I did is actually doubling what I have which is worse situation where we need to move anywhere <laughs> anymore and then now all of them are fragile whereas the plastic is not fragile right. so i actually made my life harder after this but i think the artist does that all the time <laughs> <laughs> um what was it like trying to match the weights between the two objects was it just a lot of back and forth and sanding I so usually I had went before st uh, carving each object so to figure out the size that matches the weight. Uh, I I cut a like an inch cube. When I, I mean they're all white alabaster technically, but like I cut the one inch cube from each stone that I use for each one each piece, and then figure out how much it weighs like one inch cube weighs then like make a drawing oh like for example the mattress mattress was pretty easy where oh like i need like 10 inch cube this way 12 this way then i know how much it will weigh for example um so that's usually how i found and then i kind of cut the stone like a hun like you know bigger than my assumption or my sketch then I cut it down like I carved it down so that I can kind of there there's a wiggle room in case my my because it's literally just like kind of easy math math you know of like kind of back and forth so and then like for example the step stool because it has so much negative space basically I disassembled um, the IKEA step stool and then use, you know, I did like one by one. So 
that one, the stone one is also made with like a four parts. And then when I actually glue them together, I look at the IKEA instruction in case nothing fits. Because I never know how they design stuff like or why there's a reason why this is a first step and then second step. So after making the parts in stone, I look at the IKEA instruction to, to glue them together. Well, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> Sujung, this has been really a, a treat. I, I personally have many more questions, but I think we're at our um, end. So thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. We do have another um, four in the series. So um, please let us know if you would like to be part of that. And um, we'll be happy to send you the links. Thank you so much. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.